of DEI JB conversations. The B, of course, is for belonging. You likely are more familiar with diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Um, but there is a movement to add the B to this work, and uh, that I think is so important for us in spiritual community um, because it really um, pulls at the principle of oneness that we anchor all of our teachings on. And I think it's so important for us to really bring that into um, our conversation here. So welcome to all of you who are joining. Welcome to who may be watching the replay. We will begin because we have um, a lot packed into this hour. And um, so I, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on housekeeping. We already were able to do some of that. Um, but do raise your hand if you have any questions or need any support as we're going through this content. Um, so today's topic is preparing for pride, pronouns, and other easy things. And I pulled that topic um, title from a conversation I had with a room full of about 300 New Thought leaders at the Parliament of the World Religions last August in Chicago. And the topic was on gender and pronouns. And about the time the sixth or seventh person got up to the mic and talked about how hard it is to use pronouns, I hopped up and said, if you can run a church, you can learn some pronouns. <laughs> and um, it just was hurting my heart to see how um, we were almost cementing this idea that this is really too hard and that it is confusing. And, and I will give that it is new-ish. I mean, I think we're coming around on 20 years of people really exploring um, using um, chosen pronouns. Um, so when we look sort of dial back um, out of our own personal experience with it, um, there's been enough time for us um, to really engage this conversation. And my hope and my request from the room at Parliament was that there was a time in the 80s where Michael Beckwith you know, was proclaimed the Antichrist um, for performing same-sex unions at the time. Um, and that New Thought was really on the leading edge of conversations and um, affirming the LGBTQ community within a spiritual context. And I would really love, and it's in my heart's desire that, that unity especially, but all of New Thought really reclaim that place on the leading edge of all of these conversations because of the foundation of our oneness principle. This is how we demonstrate oneness. And um, so I'm gonna share that request and, and that desire of my heart with each of you as well. And so I got this great quote, James Baldwin, love takes off the masks we fear we cannot live without and no, we cannot live within. I'm gonna invite you to take that in. Love takes off the masks we fear we cannot live without and no, we cannot live within. So everything we talk about today, I want us to really bring back to that heart, um, to that presence of love and to our commitment and desire Many of us in our spiritual communities or alternative ministries have values and many, many include love or loving or some variation of the word love in our core values. And it is, um, you know, among the greatest, we, we call spirit, God, universe, a presence of love itself. And so I want to really invoke the power of love into this conversation as well. And um, with that, I want to introduce to you a love bunny. Is it okay if I call you that, James? I just did. Maybe I should ask permission, but this man is so precious, James Masters. I've had the great joy of learning um, about him, who he is, and getting to work with him in the work that we do with folks with faith, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But first, I want to introduce you to him. I asked him to join us for this conversation because he has um, a unique story, as we all do, of how he came into unity and his path through and in religious trauma and, and then into unity and in the effort of really keeping this conversation um, anchored in the heart and to truly understand what it takes for someone from the LGBTQ community to walk through the threshold, to cross the threshold into any church building. Um, I want us to always have something to, um, so that if you don't know someone personally, um, that you will now know James and his story and that you will have a deeper understanding and heart for what it takes to, to make that move. So James, I wanna welcome you into the call and thank you so much for being willing to share your heart. 
Thank you, Jackie. Um, did you want me to go ahead and share uh, some? Okay. All right. So um, my name is James. I have been a part of Unity for 20 or um, since 2020. And um, I have been a part of New Thought, although didn't never really attended a New Thought church um, <clears throat> since uh, 2005 is when I was introduced to Louise Hayes' work. And before then, I, I grew up in a fairly high control religion. I came out at the age of 13 and um, I didn't even really know uh, that being gay was wrong because that was something that they didn't talk about things like sex. But immediately, um, you know, I found out that that was not okay within my parents' religion. Um, just moving forward after that, I spent five years uh, in three different conversion therapy programs. And conversion therapy, are, those are programs that try to um, make gay people straight. And uh, and I've been in therapy all this whole time, and I still have trouble sometimes walking into a church. Like I, what happens? Um, it's called complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, is it, I have physiological issues, especially. It's interesting. Like Unity of Springfield is the the church I attend. Sometimes when I go into certain rooms, because they are so they look so much like a traditional church. I will start sweating or start shaking. Um, I found at Unity Village that that the when I went there, I, I experienced in certain areas, I experienced the same thing. And so this is a lifelong process. And, you know, starting that process, of, you know, trying to fix it at the age of 13 onward to, until I was 25. And there were, there were times when I was like, okay, that's all baloney. Um, but what happens is the, the mind gets trained, you know, like we use affirmations and, and denials. The affirmation was constantly something is wrong with me. Something is wrong with me. And untangling all of that has been a lifelong process as well. And it's still, you know, it's still ongoing. And so I think that keeping that in mind and ensuring that, that, you know, especially if you're going to be at a pride event, make sure if you're bringing people in that they're coming into a really safe place. I'm glad that we're talking about pronouns. Um, you know, I, I think that sometimes automatically assume, we assume, oh, unity is a safe place for everyone. And I will, I'll tell you, you know, my husband and I first started going to unity in 2020 and I just knew spirit said, go to unity. So I was not really, um, I was just trying to take, you know, stuff in and I was not being very reactive to stuff, even though there was stuff that I noticed. My husband, however, said, I'm not going here. They're homophobic. Like I can't, I can't do this. And, um, so he didn't, he started attending maybe a year ago. And so in all of that, you know, take that in when you go to a pride event, make sure you, that people are coming into a really safe place. Um, because like I said, I still have challenges when it comes to that physiological stuff. My brain may be saying one thing, but my body at certain times is saying, get out of there. You know, this is not a safe place. And so, um, yeah, Jackie, did you have anything else that like questions or anything? Yeah, I think um, so. Um, James is at Unity of Springfield, and I'm on a presence that part of the country is in southern Missouri, and um, and so there's you know I think um, an important thing to sort of note about that, James. But you also, um, where did you grow up, and and where where did you come from, just in your spiritual sure, journey? I'd I love for you to talk about seminary too. Okay, so I I grew up in uh, Michigan, and I moved to Kansas City to uh, go to seminary. Um, I, I figured I would go into the ministry and that's when I started questioning, particularly conversion therapy. And then that just toppled everything else because I recognized, you know, I was being told, Hey, I, I can change my sexuality. And, and we had, I had people that were telling you, Hey, you can change your sexuality. I did it, uh, in seminary, they had one of the largest conversion therapy programs in the United States. And, um, so I started walking around and using the Bible because, you know, we were all pretty literate in the Bible. And I said, you know, the book of Revelation says that uh, liars have their place in the lake of fire. And so let me know, are you really straight? Like, did this really change you? Or, you know, are you still gay? And these are people who've been married for years. And they're all like, we still struggle with homosexuality. And at that moment, I realized, hey, there is, this is, this is not, you know, this is not working for anyone. And I witnessed it doing a lot of harm. So I will tell you, out of the conversion therapy that I went to, I know five people that have either died of drug overdoses or committed suicide. And to me, drug overdose is a form of suicide. 
And so that, you know, that like that whole experience and, and when I, so I did not leave, like a lot of people when they're like, this is not working, they just, they just jet out. I did not. I started standing up and saying, Hey, this is not working for anyone. And this is doing harm to a lot of people. And I stayed in, in the Bible school and I stayed, uh, I didn't stay in the conversion therapy program. I just started speaking out against it until they kicked me out. And at that point in time, because I was so integrated into that community, I was working for um, the ministry. I was living on campus. I was, uh, you know, it was my whole community. It was my family. It was everything. And so at that moment, when they kicked me out, it, it wasn't just getting kicked out of a church. It was losing everything. So it actually makes a lot of sense that I would have complex. And it took me a lot of therapy to realize, oh yeah, that that just makes sense. This is a, this is, uh, you know, a thing that is, it's, my history is, is over, but the, like I said, we have physiological responses when we experience trauma. And that was a major traumatic event. I literally lost everything in one day. Um, and thankfully the gay community, I think the reason why I'm still alive today is the gay community in Kansas city just surrounded me. I, you know, I met somebody in a coffee shop who went to Midwest Bible uh, Seminary and got kicked out and just stayed in Kansas City. And um, I met him at a coffee shop the next day. And he said, you know, what? I have a five bedroom house. Why don't you come live with me? And I had a minister in Kansas City, even though I never attended his church, just really took me under his wing and mentored me. And I will tell you at the time, and there were a lot of people that had a major impact in my life. But I will, at the time, I was probably as cuddly as a porcupine. I was, you know, I, it was not, it was probably not easy for them. And it certainly was not easy for me, but they made it so that I survived this experience. And like I said, not, not everyone survives it. Um, and I, I really, you know, and then new thought introduction to new thought that really, you know, helped me understand I, you know, I am okay. Like I, the, you know, there's nothing innately wrong with me. I'm a child of God. Um, although I stopped using religious language for a long time. That's another thing that sometimes triggers me at Unity too. There's so much religious language and Louise Hay didn't use any religious language, but um, yeah. And let's see. Well, I will tell you, this is an, an interesting part of my story. The guy that invited me to live with him with the five bed, large, beautiful five bedroom house, he was sitting with a friend and said to that friend the day before in the same coffee shop, I want God to send someone that I can help. And I showed up the very next day. So I will say, if you have the intention to promote healing, particularly within the, the queer community, the LGBTQI community, um, just make that intention and the universe will set it up so that you can promote healing in that way. So, and I learned that 10 years after he said, he told me the story, like, yeah, the day I met you was the day after I just told my friend that I wanted God to, you know, send someone for me to help. So. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much, James, for sharing that. I do want to give a little space in case anyone, if you're open to it and okay with that, if anyone has any um questions and I'm sure they have lots of love to pour on you and gratitude for we're just you know helping to create this safe and brave space which is something I always ask us to well in all the one month I've been doing this I ask us to do is to collectively create a safe and brave space but if is there anyone that wants to ask a question or or share a thought Ariana yeah thank you James for sharing your story I'm I'm there are so many pieces of it that are interesting to me one is the the what it what it is really in a room that looks like a traditional church that we could begin to shift that would be helpful sure you know that's a hard one for me to answer because i recognize this is a me thing it's not the church i would say far more important is to like honor people's pronouns and learn the language of affirmation um, because I think that sometimes people don't, they, they're not malicious. People at Unity, none of them are malicious. They just don't really understand the language that is actually inclusive. I mean, just a really quick example. I have, we have one lady um, who's, who's uh, in leadership in our church that constantly comes up to my husband and I and says, you're so brave. 
just for existing, right? And that, and we're just existing. And, and that kind of makes us feel uncomfortable every time. And we're just like, yeah, okay, thank you. You know, um, just little things like that, you know, um, it's not necessarily my bravery as much as it is my resilience that I think she's recognizing, but you know, I just think paying attention to how we're communicating with people and learning that affirmation of language or affirmative language is really important. And that, I mean, that's what we're trying to do at Folks with Faith is, you know, create that context for um, those types of conversations. I love that. My uh, my community would 100% say what you just said. That would awesome. absolutely happen. My, my oh, you owe the, yeah. You, they would tell you, you how brave you are. Yeah. And, and it's one of the, you know, one of the interesting challenges is finding the right language and demonstrate, demonstrating the right language and, um, and, and figuring out how we do this because, you know, inclusivity is in our mission statement. It's what we really care about. And we're missing the boat if you walk in and look at the community. Mm -hmm. so being able to figure out where the disconnection is and make some shifts really, really matters. So, thank yeah. You. Thank you. Anyone else? Nicole. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us. It's an honor to receive you. Um, what inclusive language can you share with us that we can start practice using um, so that we're more clear and speaking in a way that um, is more affirming? That's a good question. I, well, first of all, we're talking uh, pronouns is actually in this this meeting. I would say, do you do, with do you guys wear name tags and do you have pronouns on them? No. Okay. So that's one thing because if if somebody sees a name tag with a pronoun, they already they automatically go, oh, hey, this person is at least trying to be a safe person. Um, when you so I do um, some spirit groups and stuff with Unity of Springfield. And one of the things we always ask, you know, before we share, can you, you know, give us your pronouns? And just asking that question is, is a way to be inclusive. Even if you already know everyone's pronouns, I think that one of, that's actually a good way to start training yourself to be inclusive. You know, use your pronouns every, everywhere. I, you know, I try to sign every email with my pronouns that, you know, when I'm engaging in certain things, I had my volunteer at the end of my name, but a lot of times I, even on Zoom, I'll have my pronouns using them regularly that that would be a good thing and just paying attention like um like would you want like how would it make you feel if somebody went up to you and your your spouse and said you are so brave coming in here and holding your your husband or wife's hand you're so i mean like that's just and i'm and i'm I just use that as an example because it just happened you know fairly recently but like you wouldn't say that to a straight couple so, so what you're really identifying is look at how different you are, you know, like, and, and that's not necessarily as inclusive. And I, I would add to that too, it, um, context is everything uh, and, and relationship is everything. And so, you know, what James is describing is very specific to being in a community setting, going about his business with his husband and someone coming in and offering out of the blue, this kind of statement or feedback, which is very different than a group of friends sitting at a table and maybe a straight couple and a gay couple and having that conversation and having a feedback statement of, you know, you guys are so brave, you know, we're sitting here and I'm noticing that, you know, three heads turned and snarled when we walked in or, you know, something like that, oh, right, right. you know, like, like so mm -hmm. I, like, I just want us to really um, give context to um, the words we use and so that we're thinking completely about the scenarios that are being described. And, and here's the thing, sometimes that's a really appropriate statement because, you know, even the work that we're doing with, uh, folks, with folks with faith, that takes courage. And so in that context, you're so brave makes total sense. But just attending a church service, to me, I mean, it just, to me, I was like, why is this constantly, you know, coming up that, first of all, I'm in a unity church, so it doesn't, I would hope it doesn't take much courage for most gay couples to be in a unity church, so, yeah. Thank you. And I don't really know that woman very well. She just is a, a lady that goes to the church. All right, let's dive into pronouns since they're, they're coming up. 
There we go. Pronouns 101. It's easy. You might say it's hard or you might hear someone say it's hard. And, and I think the question of harder than what? Like, what do we mean when we say it's hard? Um, it's confusing. Why is it confusing? I mean, these are like sort of just questions to break those thought patterns. At one point, everything we do was not a habit. You are capable. And again, if you can run a church, you can learn some pronouns. And there are things that we do every day that are a lot harder than this. And so you'll see on the left of the screen, and language is evolving. Um, so these are some pronouns that are um, popular right now. There are some people who make up their own pronouns, um, but they, them, they, he, he, they, he, him, z, her, and up at the top with the X, I say Zzer, um, and you'll see those sometimes with a Z as well. Um, she, her, she, they, they, she, or all pronouns. And you'll see that these are kind of in the shape of buttons. And so at Unity Church of Overland Park, we have stickers um, with a lot of these combinations, not all of them, but the, the stickers came with some blank stickers as well so that people could write their own pronouns on there. We do wear name tags and they're just lanyards that um, go around the neck and hang. Um, and so it's really easy to stick um, a pronoun sticker on there. And it's easy to change it out or put one over it if people's pronouns change. And we make that part of the language when we first invite someone who either is getting a new name tag or if the name tag team that are handing out uh, name tags on Sundays notice that someone doesn't have um, a pronoun sticker, there'll be just a, a brief conversation of encouraging or inviting people to, to take one. And if you don't see one that reflects your pronouns, you can, um, here's a pen, you can write it in. Um, but kind of what James was saying, you know, it's really about modeling that. So if you are going to launch a new pronoun sticker, um, it's, Pride is a great time to do it, which is why we're talking about this in April, so to give you some time to prepare for Pride Month in June. Um, so it gives context for your community of like, oh, you know, instead of just sort of out of the blue, but also why not do it out of the blue? You know, when you have a realization um, of something that you want to share with your community, we, we don't overthink it in other areas. So we don't have to overthink it in this area. But if you want to sort of do, you know, have some momentum built up and, um, and take time to prepare, um, at least and prepare your key leaders and volunteers, um, you know, June is a great time to, to roll this out. Um, so to gather what will work for your community to train your leaders on why pronouns are important and to be able to have the conversation. So that's why, you know, I put the question on there, the statement, it's hard because it's something that I hear a lot or it's so confusing and they're changing all the time and people's individual pronouns will change over time. So I just learned this and now they're this. Um, and okay, but we do hard things all the time and much harder things. And if we bring this back to that, um, the value of love, you know, what we do in terms of loving people can sometimes be very hard, but in this particular way can also be very easy. So I think changing the thought about that is really important. I also want to give a couple of, of examples because you'll hear um, some people say, you know, it's, um, not grammatically correct, you know, for someone, an individual to be called they, and it's so hard for me to just get used to that and wrap my head around that. Well, if person A says someone called for you, person B might say, did they leave a message? You're just now referring to a single person as a they with a they pronoun. It's something we do in language all the time, and it is, in fact, grammatically correct. Another example, when someone over 18 travels by plane, they need to have ID, a ticket, and patience grammatically correct and something we do in language all the time. What we aren't used to is if we know a person specifically, so these both of these examples are about an unknown person, um, then we want to be able to identify them. And this is such a rich, I mean, talk about sermon fodder, right? It's such a rich um, idea to talk about of the assumptions that we make and the categories and labels we put on people. The more we know them, then we'd like to just fit them into a neat little box so that we always know how to refer to them and talk about them. And we often don't change the way we talk about people, even though people are dynamic and changing all the time. So someone who maybe was once funny <laughs> can no longer tell a good joke. You know, you might still refer to them as a funny person, you know, but so like really, you know, waking up and being um, present with what is before us um, is, is the opportunity and what's behind all of this. And yes, I understand that it's easy. Um, 
to sort of default to grammar um, tricks and all of that, but when we instead default to the heart and to um, honoring people and the way that they want to be um, recognized and identified, that that is really easy as ministers to do. So how do we use pronouns in community? Again, it's easy, but it takes intention and time like everything else we do. So, you know, we wanna begin with educating our community and, and then we wanna model. Like, so we wanna make sure that um, as leaders, we are modeling and that also our key leaders, um, all of our staff and our lay leaders are also modeling um, the use of pronouns and then um, name tag stickers. So under education, you'll see anchor in the value of love, which I've talked about. Inclusiveness is often a very common core value that we have. So we can always bring it back to mission and values as well. And oneness, which is a principle that we, um, we anchor our teachings in. Um, and, and this is also an expression of oneness and how we honor. Oneness is not sameness, but that we honor the diverse expression of spirit and that we honor people's um, ability and sovereignty to self-identify what kind of expression of spirit they are, what flavor of spirit they are, and that we allow ourselves to be um, willing to, to honor that. And so modeling the use of pronouns from the platform, which includes, you know, your email and all of your communications. But, you know, James said, you know, asking people what their pronouns are, and, and I encourage them first introduce yourself with your pronouns. I'm Jackie, my pronouns are she, they. Right now you've already indicated to someone that this is a safe place for them to identify their pronouns. And, um, and if someone's pronouns have changed, I mean, even at our dinner table um, with our kids, my, my grown children are 21 and 19 now, but they were not always this old and I still call them kids. So there we go. I have yet to adapt to their new expression. Um, and our youngest is seven, um, but we have for years now had regular, just once in a while at the dinner table, but consistent enough um, that, that it made it um, okay. Like, what are your pronouns? What pronouns are you using? And to have conversation about that so that it allowed if, um, if something changed, it gave space to do that without having to come out or make a grand statement um, or you know, performance of it. Not that it is a performance, but it might feel like um, to the individual that this is something I have to do. And, and it puts them in a vulnerable position to also then receive feedback about that. So by getting ahead of it and being proactive and just normalizing the, um, you know, presencing pronouns and, and that how important it is to identify it, then it, it just really goes a long way to create that safe and brave space. And so that it's not just people who use pronouns you might not guess or alternate pronouns are not the only ones who, um, who have to do it, right? Um, so that if you present as a woman and your pronouns are she, her, it's as important for you to say that um, out loud so that that space is identified as a, as a safe space for the LGBTQ community. Again, names, tag stickers, you can get all kinds, all kinds on Amazon, uh, make them available, model by using it yourself um, and have your leaders, your lay leaders use them and, and to encourage your congregation to use them. That The more of us who do this, the more comfortable it is for someone new in our community or for someone who's making a change to make that change and come out. And it doesn't have to be like, oh, spotlight on you because we're, we're all doing it and we're all here um, affirming how important this is. Um, here, before I move on from pronouns, any questions or thoughts about that? Any experiences you want to share? I have one you. quick question, Jackie. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have friends who use they, and sometimes I forget, and I automatically say he or she. So then how do I correct that without being making it worse? <laughs> you know, it happens all the time. And what I find often, um, because I'm, I make the mistake too. I mean, I'm cued into using pronouns, and especially if someone who's made a change, um, there's, I, I think of one leader, uh, he's a leader, they, see, I just did it, he, they are a leader in our community, and um, recently went from he, him, to they, them, um, and their spouse is also um, a leader in our community, and um, 
oftentimes we, she will correct herself in front of me and I do the same. And so it's like, you know, we're both like, ah, you know, but you just do your best. You just, as soon as you catch it, you just correct it, but not, you don't need to apologize. Um, I, I would, well, you can apologize, but kind of like the nuance that James was sharing, um, you want to make sure that you're guarding impact. So if you're making a bigger deal and it interrupts conversation and the flow of conversation, I don't think it's important because if you immediately correct yourself, the person knows that you're correcting yourself. The apology is, I think, more important if um, it's coming from someone who isn't even trying or isn't remembering repeatedly over, you know, over time and is, or is not acknowledging it. That's where maybe um, you've built up the kind of karma that would warrant an apology. But if you're in conversation and, um, you know, and I've even said it, you know, from the platform and so, and I'll do it in the same sort of paragraph, I'll talk about them and they, and then I'll say, and he, and just, you know, them correct myself and then keep on going um, because it also models that vulnerability of, of it's not hard and I'm not going to necessarily get it perfect all the time because it's new and it takes time for all of us to adjust to new things. Um, um, so does that help? Does anyone else have any thoughts to add to that? I don't have any thoughts to add to that, but I'm curious about the name tag stickers. So do you have how do you have it in your church? Because um, I'm thinking to like just having everybody write their name and then, you know, I don't know. <laughs> well, so we have lanyards um, and people reuse the same name tag. So they've written on their paper, some people will decorate it or whatever and put their paper with their name inside the lanyard. And those are in trays. So every week they grab their lanyard and put it on. So the, the sticker goes on the outside of that, on the plastic. Right. And um, so then it, um, so say more about your question. Well, I was just like, and, and I hear you with the lanyards and then you stick the paper inside that. So that might work better. Um, I was just thinking if you had those ones that are just one-time use, mm you know, then that right. would be a lot to go through. Yes, so that that's what I was like, how could this be sustainable? And then right. the other thought I have is if like, we have a lot of visitors, you know, that come and go, um, do you just have everybody do a name tag or if they're just members or, you know, yeah, the way we do it, um, we invite everyone to make a name tag. Um, and those who come regularly or you know have been recently are in one bin and those who come less recently are kind of taken out and put in a different bin and that's only because otherwise you have so many name tags it takes a long time to find yours mm -hmm. um so that's what works for us um but yeah i agree that that would be a lot um to go through if you were doing one-time use name tags um mm -hmm. but i would say i know um when we used to do um one-time use name tags um we would print our own and if you're printing your own um you could do name pronouns and put mm -hmm. it on there so it would invite someone or just when people are getting a here's a name tag write your name and your pronouns for us and it could just be that easy and whether they do or not is not as important as presencing and in, in, in making the invitation and then when they look around and everyone else has pronouns on theirs they might go back and add theirs or or not you know, and that's fine. But again, it's, um, it's creating that atmosphere that's um, encouraging and, and really, I would say, blatantly inclusive, right? Mm -hmm. Very plainly and visibly inclusive. Okay, thank you. And it's a way, and Ariana, I kind of, you know, thinking back to what you said that, you know, you have inclusivity as a value, but if you look around the room, <laughs> you know, you don't necessarily see the diversity, but there's a way, you know, even if everyone in the room is straight and using, um, I'll just say regular pronouns, um, but if they all have them visible and if people are still in the habit of introducing themselves with their pronouns, you're still demonstrating that value. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, we have, um, we have indicators on both sides. Uh, we talk about religious inclusivity here a lot and we have indicators of numerous faiths 
along the walls in our sanctuary. So there's, I mean, it's, if you walk in, you're immediately going to see we're serious about it. If any of these are familiar to you, you know, they hang here regular. They are, they're part of our, of our structure. And I was just trying to think what could go in the room, yeah. you know, what, what could we add in the room that would, would help to create that same sense. So glad you asked. <laughs> So I'm going to go to the next slide. And uh, again, back to um, participating in Pride Fest and preparing for it. I'm also going to talk about that, what you can um, change in your space um, that would be on a more permanent basis. But since Pride is coming up, um, I encourage you to walk in the Pride Parade. If you can get a group of your congregants to walk in the Pride Parade, um, everyone can get, you know, proud ally t-shirts if they're, you know, if you're allies and you don't have any representation from the LGBTQ community, um, you know, even that it goes such a long way of, you know, really demonstrating that inclusivity and love. Sponsor a booth. Um, get some volunteers to commit to working a booth at Pride. Of uh, lots and lots of churches, even the Presbyterians, have booths at Pride. Okay, so um, you will not be alone in terms of church. Um, give away swag, give away literature. You can get those great worthy booklets. And I happen to know um, from Unity Village, and I happen to know that they're working on a new one, um, or they will be working on a new one. Um, but they have that. They have other booklets. Um, we included the Timeless Daily Words. Um, at our pride booth. Now, they didn't exactly fly off the table as fast as the condoms did, which I'll get to in a little bit, but um, it still stopped people in their tracks and people looked and some people did take them. Um, so, you know, by sponsoring a booth, you can um, have items to give away. You can have literature about your own community to give away and you demonstrate love and affirm um, that expression of love and, um, and being an affirming community. And so just you're giving love away is what you're doing. You're looking people in the eye and you're saying, I see you and you are welcome here. Even if you never show up, you know, this is a safe place for you. Um, and there will be people who have asked questions. Oh, I don't go to church, you know, but I had a 25 minute conversation with someone who began the conversation by telling me she swore off church, would never go to a church again and didn't even want to talk about it. And then she wouldn't shut up. <laughs> and so we, we had a beautiful conversation. Now she's not from, you know, the city, so she's not been to our church, but who knows, you know, what the healing that did in her, even just having that conversation. And, and planting a seed that that not all church experience would, could be, you know, would be like that, that there are other options out there. Um, and then have a plan for after pride. And that's a little bit what you're talking about, Ariana. So what happens when people come into the community and James mentioned that too. So we want to begin before pride to have these conversations in our community to get pronoun ready, for example, um, to really agree as a community that this is something that is important to us to be um, truly welcoming to the LGBTQ community. It's so easy in our unity congregations um, to just default to, well, we've always accepted everyone. And um, one, that's not true. It's factually untrue. And two, we haven't always done it well. Um, and three, the real question is what are we doing now and today and how can we do this in the year 2024 in the best way possible? How can we really be forward leaning and, um, and actively um, inclusive? And then um, encourage all of your congregants, get the straight folks out there, get the cisgender straight folks out there because the experience of being at Pride will be life-changing. And, um, and it will help people to understand at a deeper level why it is so important to be there. Um, so get them, if they, if they don't want to volunteer at the booth, get them to go. And um, oftentimes, um, if you volunteer at the booth, you can get into Pride. So we would do two-hour shifts and then encourage people. And we would tell people, the volunteers, what booths to kind of go see just to get them out there and feel like they had somewhere to go. Because if it's your first time at Pride and you are cisgender straight and you were born, you know, uh, I, I'll just say the baby booner generation or older, it might be very uncomfortable. So walk with them or, or, or have them in pairs and also point them in a direction to go and let people explore and just experience it. It is also super fun, super fun. I, mean, I have not been to a Pride experience that was not really, really fun. So I wanna share with you um, folks with faith 
as I mentioned, and James is our program coordinator. And that was a program that is um, now funded by the LEAP grant uh, through Unity Worldwide Ministries. And it started at Unity Church of Overland Park. And it is our LGBTQ ministry. And we have been able through the LEAP grant to expand it to um, allow other Unity churches and New Thought churches to um, create chapters in your own community. And what we do is we hold your hand through the whole process of establishing your own chapter. We give you programming, we give you um, PowerPoints and um, outlines for how to create your own chapter meetings. Um, we give you swag to take to pride. So you'll see at the top picture, it's, you know, I think it's kind of small, but there are bookmarks, which I'll show you um, bigger, um, a, a little video of what the bookmarks look like, but they have this great quote by Ram Das that treat everyone you meet like God in drag. I mean, come on, right? Come on. <laughs> You want to show people right away when they walk into your building, put those bookmarks on your counter. Um, and then, you know, for that, there's a QR code to Folks of Faith website. And if you are a chapter, your church will be in our directory on the website. So people will find their way back to you and to where you are. This middle picture here um, is a banner stand that we have. And this, I don't know, was maybe a hundred bucks. Um, a little bit more, a little bit less. Um, and we put it, we, we got it for folks of faith and to use at Pride and at convention when we have our folks of faith booth there. But um, we also were like, wait a minute, let's just put this up every Sunday during service. And so that, again, there's something visible that tells people we have a commitment to the LGBTQ community right away before they've even shook a, an usher or greeter's hand. They can see the rainbow. It's very clearly marked um, and learn a little bit more about um in this case, folks with faith, but this was cheap. Um, you can get it. Um, again, you'll see here the picture. There's myself with um, Jim Skinner, who's married to Reverend Carlin McClellan. So you might know him. He's on my board at Unity Church of Overland Park. And Reverend Eileen Sulak, who's our associate, and she's wearing a proud ally shirt. So she stocked up before June last year on all of her ally t-shirts, and she's got several. But you can see behind her, we've got the Unity Progressive Pride flag. We've got a trans flag. We have um, the banner behind us. So this was at our booth at Pride Fest. Um, and you'll see too, we had a disco ball. I mean, we wanted to make it fun. Um, we had a basket of condoms that are branded folks of faith and with the affirmation, pray hard. So this is not your Sunday material necessarily. <laughs> I see here, Anna laughing. <laughs> this is not necessarily your Sunday material, but this is Pride Fest. And at Pride Fest, um, it stopped people in their tracks and people want condoms. And so if they're staying there and we have multicolor mm -hmm. and they're like, can I have more than one? Absolutely. Get all of your favorite colors. Just make me a promise that you will use them before they expire. That was my spiel. And, you know, as my volunteer congregants will look at the minister saying this, but, you know, to be sex positive, to be, um, you know, to really reach out so that people can reach in is what we're doing here. Of like, let's meet people where they are. And, and how do you strike up conversation with people who are so traumatized, you know, who describe what James described at the beginning of our call? Um, the first time I walked into a Unity Church, a trans woman opened the door. She was the greeter that day. I was there for a job interview, and I could not believe it. And who I was at that time, I thought, I got to get out of here. I will go straight to hell for being at this church. That's who I was at that time. And yet my soul was seeking for a church that my whole family could attend. And it was six months. I worked there for six months, three services a week, one on Saturday, two on Sunday, before I would take my kids. It took me that long to really trust that this was a safe place. And um, that's the power of a unity environment and unity teachings. They are life-changing and don't ever lose sight of that. You'll see the t-shirt I'm wearing there and I'm wearing it today, fine and divine. Um, and that's a folks with face shirt that um, we designed with the trans flag colors, um, the skin tone colors, and then the rainbow colors, of course. So James has done the great work of creating um, swag packages that you can order from folks with faith with all of these great um, um, swag items in them, including keychains. So you get keychains, condoms, the bookmarks. Um, you'll get a couple of t-shirts for your volunteers to wear. Um, anything else? The worthy booklets? Am I forgetting anything, James? I think that's what we have put together. Worthy booklets, uh, the unity pride flag right? Yes, the Unity um, Pride flag. And I know a lot of you have them, but they're not very big. 
um, you know, so you could put a couple up, you know, and we just took like a, um, a background stand, um, like that hangs like a background um, for a photo or video. And we just took that um, and, and hung the flags from those. Um, and you don't, at Pride, you know, we took the important things, the money box, because we were accepting donations for our Sabrina Ellis scholarship for transgender folks. Um, so we would take that away, but everything else we just kind of packed in and made sure it was um, not going to be harmed by the weather. We had a little bit of rain last year. Um, but I want to show you this. Um, this video shows you the, that's the bookmark, and it's a very nice size bookmark. And who doesn't love a bookmark? Um, treat everyone you meet like God and drag, and you can see the backside. I mean, put those in your lobby at your community, and people are going to know immediately something, something's going on here that is different and that is safe and is extraordinary. Um, I will invite you, we're, we're getting down to our last 10 minutes, and I want to just be sure and invite you on April 25th, we have a leadership inquiry meeting. So if you are interested in getting more information about creating a folks of faith chapter in your community, you don't even have to, if you are not in church ministry, it does not require a church um, environment. You can start a community chapter. Um, you can start it with within your alternative ministry. So I just want to say that for those who are, are retired, um, you can have a social group that is a folks of faith chapter. Um, and there's so much that, that we have created for you that is even beyond just the um, products that we've been talking about, but also there are courses, there are classes you can take um, online um, to cultivate your own competency to queer culture, to learn how to be a better ally, an effective ally, um, to learn more about pronouns. And so I don't wanna to say too much more about that. Come to the meeting though, to learn all about it and ask all of your questions. And you can um, visit our website to register that. And that's folkswithfaith.org, folkswithfaith.org. James, would you put that in the chat for me, please? Also would love to invite you to our, we have a fourth Saturday gathering every month at 1030 a.m. It's always on Zoom and we always also have ASL interpreters provided. That is our commitment to inc uh, radical inclusivity. Um, everything we do is ASL accessible. And we have the Reverend Deborah Johnson, who I'm sure many of you know, she's uh, with UFBL. She's <laughs> extraordinary uh, human being, and she will be our guest presenter for that. And all are welcome. So it's um, anchored at the Unity Church of Overland Park chapter, but um, we always have a really good hybrid experience um, with that. And then... Uh, so in two weeks, we will meet again for this group, and it will be our reflection session. So I'm going to give you a little homework to introduce yourself with your pronouns between now and then, every chance you get, and to add your pronouns to your email signature and or your Zoom name. And so I just copied my email signature so you can see what that looks like. Reverend Jackie Fernandez, MDiv, she, they. It'll be that simple. And so... I'm not going to check your work. That's all up to you. But this is just a couple of ways for you to practice um, doing it, to practice modeling um, the power of pronouns and the, the power of being the first one to include that in the conversation. And notice if you're introducing yourself, how people respond. And notice if you send an email out with your pronouns added, if anyone asks you about that um, or asks why it's important. Um, and then in May, I'll just give you a teaser to next month, more than just accessibility. And I love that word just because it has multiple meanings. So more than just accessibility, um, you know, what we're required to do by law. Um, and, then, and then more than just accessibility, how do we really um, create um, an inclusive space that is beyond just making it accessible? So that'll be for May. We have a few minutes, which I wanted to do to go back and then ask any questions, allow you give you space to ask questions or any ideas that came to mind about what might be a powerful for your community. Um, Ariana, did you get any ideas from what we talked about? Got some great ideas and thank you so much. I, I think, um, Jackie, the, the question that I'll bring into our session in two weeks is what I heard both you and James talk about over and over again was showing that you're a safe community. Was that word safe? That this is a safe place? And I would love to drill down a little bit into what safe means and um, how I prepare my community because getting them to pride, they'll go. Getting them to, you know, to participate, all of that because it's out there and they don't really have to do the hard work 
which is we're inviting people into our home. How will we greet them? What does safety really mean? Safe from what? And so I don't want to do that disservice to anybody. I don't want to I don't want to say ours is a safe and welcoming community and then have them have an unsafe experience. And um, and so I'll I'll be interested in that's I know that's a whole big subject, but I, I would love to have more conversation around around what safety really means when we get back together for discussion. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and I can give you a quick example that um and I've talked to you about this, Ariana. Um, I went to see a doctor a couple months ago, and in her office, in the exam room, was a safe space sticker with the rainbow around it. Um, and in the course of our conversation, um, she made several comments about her marriage and how she's been married for 35 years, and her marriage would be a certain way where my marriage is long distance. And she was trying to tell me that there was something wrong with that. And apart from the conversation of don't tell me there's anything wrong with my marriage because it doesn't look like yours the fact that as soon as she brought up you know I've I've been married for 35 years and it's like well it was not possible it it has not been possible for me to be legally married for 35 years so she's just started chipping away um at at safety right in in a lot of different ways and so I share that that she was well-meaning and I think in her mind was doing a really good job of, of showing that she knows something about marriage and trying to ask questions. Um, and so there, and that may, I don't know, in some ways be an extreme example, but when we are in a spiritual setting, there are people who've been chaplains for 30 years who would think that anything they say is only going to be out of love and care and concern and might step completely in it. And so um, it's really important, the question you're asking, and yes, we will take deeper dives into that and to be able to bring, you know, notice if there's, if you can have a conversation with someone in your community from the LGBTQ community, who's been in your spiritual community for a while and ask, you know, have you ever felt unsafe here? And I would love for you to bring those circumstances in and we can talk about that and, and talk about how do we, you know, prevent that from happening again. Now we are in the business of people, so we're always going to be stepping in it, like no matter what. And that happens within the queer community. And so that's another layer is we have internalized homophobia. I mean, James and I, um, we went through our own stuff, even just in developing the folks with faith experience of um, our own just resistance and chemicalization and uh, re-traumatization of like, you know, I think there were times where probably both of us wanted to just run as far away from this project as possible. And not because it's not our dream and something that we want to see, but it was painful to, you know, to experience that. So I don't know that the goal is to um, not ever experience um, hurt because in that is the opportunity for healing. So when we step in it, you know, as always in any context, um, there's always an opportunity that something is available for healing. And that's, you know, I think where the heart of your question is. Ariana, so and what do we do then? Yeah, thank you. Robin or Nicole, does one of you have your hands up? Robin? Just a real quick question. Could you explain the pronouns XE and ZE? No, <laughs> they are just alternate. So for someone who's non binary, they're not going to want he or she because those are in the binary. And they or them could That's potentially, you know, Maybe if someone's like, I can't do that because it's a grammatically incorrect and I don't want to be called they or them. So again, you know, people who are queer are also people, you know, <laughs> with their own experiences. So um, so that was sort of another answer. And it, I would say that was more popular in James. I'd be curious because we're different generations. Um, in my experience, it was more popular like around 2010. You would, a lot of people really took, took that. Is that what you experienced too? Um, I don't see it as much anymore, um, but, but I, I have some friends who have used that. So, yeah. So it's really for those who want to be off the binary and, and for those who are even identify as a gender, you know, which is another way to be completely out of the binary of like, there just is no gender here. I still need a pronoun or I've had some people just say, use my name. Don't use pronouns, just use my name. Becky, can I ask an, a related question? 
Mm-hmm. I am the tail end of the boomer generation. And in the boomer generation, the word queer was not a compliment. It was a it was a, a harsh and painful word for a lot of people, but it's a very commonly used word now. And I just I I find my I, my, I have a son who's non-binary saying LGBTQ plus AI, what, well, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just trying to get all of that out of my mouth, even correctly, sometimes mm-hmm. takes really, I have to concentrate on that when I want to be in the heart of the conversation. Yeah. And so I just like some, yeah. uh, some, some conversation or uh, like, t- talk to me about that word queer and how it's used and how it's, when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate, if it's not appropriate. Yeah, I think it's really important to notice the generational difference because even in the queer community, so as a Gen X here, I'm very comfortable with that word. It's, I think we were the ones who reclaimed it. Um, And I think some boomers would argue that they were the ones that reclaimed it um, first, but there are enough in the boomer generation and older who are still uncomfortable with it. They're like, ah. Um, And even in the creation of folks with faith, we use, um, you'll see in our um, website, queer community quite often, and it's sort of a way to get out of having to say LGBTQIA plus 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 all the time, and and even in our core group that started it, we had there was some conversation about that because there were some people like I just don't like it. Why do we have to use that? Why do we have to use the word queer? Even within the queer community, so it's that um, I would say is you know in some ways a universal um, generational glitch, um, and. And it understandably so, that's the word I'm looking for, understandably so, because it was, in just the way you're talking about, it was such a harmful word and it has been reclaimed. So to the question of, um, you know, I use it unapologetically and I'm aware when I'm in, um, actively in the role of minister, you know, on a Sunday, for example, um, I'm aware I just hold the awareness that this might make some people uncomfortable. I don't not use it, um, but I'm open to the conversation in just a very understanding and heartfelt way. You know, I've had a straight, you know, congregant in her 60s say, I just don't like it when you use that word and tell me, you know, and I know you want to use it. Um, So it was a good conversation in terms of her attitude about it. It wasn't one of those, you know, that we get sometimes. Um, But I just was with her and her feelings and not trying to convince like, no, you gotta let me use it. It was just with her and that like, yeah, it's, it's gotta hurt you know, to hear that over and over. And, and what it means that it hurts her heart that she loves people and doesn't want other people to be harmed. Um, so there's some healing around that. Um, again, it seems to always come back to the healing opportunities. And that is because so much pain, so much oppression, so much violence has been leveraged against the queer community. Thank you for presenting that. Yeah, thank you for answering. Yeah. I think some of the younger generations are like, oh, okay, you're so queer. <laughs> they don't want any of the labels, you know? They're just like, just, why do you need a label? So we are at our time. And so I want to honor that um, and invite you all back in two weeks and we'll we'll get deeper into the conversation and, and bring your experiences so that we can um, work through them together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.